America and our coalition took down the regime in a matter of weeks because of our superior technology, the unmatched skill of our armed forces, and above all, because we came as conquerors, not we came not as conquerors, but as liberators. And I think the whole business with Iraq is a terribly sour comedy, abstracted down to its smallest motives. But finally, there was no real, what there was there was the sense that Iraq had to be invaded because it was the first step in going toward American empire. There's no doubt that Saddam Hussein was a tyrant, a thug, a butcher. It's true. It was as true in 2003 as it was in 1983-84 when Donald Rumsfeld visited Iraq and met with Saddam Hussein and other top officials as an emissary of the Reagan administration to improve ties to Iraq. It was true in 1988 when Saddam gassed the Kurdish people in the north of Iraq with the implicit support of the United States. The United States was unconcerned with the fate of the Shia people in the south of Iraq in 1991 when after the Gulf War had ended, the U.S. allowed Saddam Hussein to very brutally put down the uprising that the United States had encouraged. In other words, the United States has consistently supported Saddam Hussein throughout the worst of his crimes when his policy was consistent with U.S. interests in the area. The minute that those interests changed, then Saddam Hussein became the center of evil in the world. Saddam Hussein's regime is a grave and gathering danger. This is the way propaganda is used to motivate a public to support a war that is really not about liberating anyone, but about extending and deepening American control. We support democracy when it's convenient to the interests of the United States of America. And maybe I'm an idealist if, you know, when I believe that there should be some sort of standard for determining how we conduct our foreign policy, but I believe there should be a standard. We are seen in the world as hypocrites, we're seen as liars, we're seen as an imperialist power. But what they're trying to do is have an Iraq that is a friend to us, not an Iraq that is liberated. That's, this is total bogus. We never intended to liberate the Iraqi people. We intended to liberate Iraq from Sodom and have a footprint, a military footprint there. And we've done that now. We have Kuwait, we have Fifth Fleet in Bahrain. We have a nice base in Qatar, but it's a little too far south. And what do we have? We have four bases in Iraq, beautiful bases. We can hit Syria, we can hit Iran, we can keep tabs on Afghanistan. There's all kinds of things we can do from those bases. The larger picture is being driven by the fact that we're about to hit peak oil worldwide that there's this sort of emerging global competition between us and China. There's the ongoing economic rivalries between us and Europe. And so the Southwest Asia becomes geopolitically a linchpin. I think they're much more interested in overall domination of playing the world policeman, of using force when they see it necessary. And behind that, really, I think there is a strategy of predation that the world has to be made safe for the procurement of resources that are needed by the United States, especially oil, wherever they are. And the idea is if you want to have real leverage or control in the future global economy, if you can sit back and control the, the tap for natural gas mostly and oil secondly, but very importantly, that will give you enormous strategic power in the world. One way you see this interconnection between anti-terrorism and oil is the increasing focus on the protection of pipelines. Maybe not something that Americans think about so much, but more and more oil is coming from inaccessible places and they have to flow from pipelines. Pipelines are a natural target for saboteurs and terrorists. And so more and more American military policy is going to be focused on the protection of these very vulnerable facilities. The war in Iraq was very, very clearly about oil, as was the invasion of Afghanistan also. The oil pipeline that was planned, the best security for that was an occupation of Afghanistan. If you map the pipeline, proposed pipeline route across to Afghanistan, and you look at our bases, matches perfectly. Our bases are there to solve a problem that Taliban could not solve. Taliban couldn't provide security in that part of Afghanistan. Well, now that's where our bases are. So is that have to do with Osama bin Laden? It has nothing to do with Osama bin Laden. Um, it has everything to do with a longer uh, plan. And in this case, uh, 
a strategy, which I wouldn't necessarily call neoconservative. However, it fits perfectly in with the neoconservative ideology, which says if you have military force and you need something from a weaker country, then you need to deploy that force and take what you need because your country's needs are paramount. It's the whole idea of unilateralism, of about using force to achieve your aims. All of this, on one hand, described as, as part of an anti-terror strategy, but underlying it is this blueprint, the Cheney blueprint, for increasing Americans' access to and control over the rest of the world's oil. The context is the desire of the United States to control these strategically crucial regions. The pretext, that is the excuse for going in, in Afghanistan was about terrorism and Osama bin Laden. In Iraq, it's about weapons of mass destruction and Saddam Hussein. But in the end, neither one of those wars was really about those people or those regimes. It was about securing and solidifying American control over these incredibly important regions of the world. We just pulled out here uh, yesterday just to uh, come out and help protect the oil line. In a tank? In a tank. So yeah, they're interested in oil, but that's a middle-run interest. Their immediate goal is intimidation. So when people say, for example, which is very frequent, that it's all about oil, of course oil's important, and of course we want control of, of oil, but oil uh, isn't enough to explain a war on Iraq. The major reason to take Iraq was a display of imperial power, it was to show both the Arab world, but not just them, but to show Europe and the Far Eastern Bloc, China and the Koreans, who was master. To make it so apparent and so overwhelming at the very outset of potential military operations that the adversary quickly realizes that, that there is no real alternative here other than to, to fight and die or to give up. What will follow will not be a repeat of any other conflict. It will be a f of a force and scope and scale that has been beyond what has been seen before. It had been planned for months, and now one day after that first airstrike, the Pentagon's shock and awe campaign was underway. The idea to blitz the capital with bombs, to stun the Iraqis into a quick surrender. This is the beginning of the shock and awe campaign. According to one official, this is going to be the entire nine yards. It was a breathtaking display of firepower. And the Pentagon says, we ain't seen nothing yet. And we keep talking about this overwhelming force uh, that we're prepared to use. I'm wondering, are you concerned at all that we will be seen as a bully? While it may have appeared to American TV viewers that shock and awe was merely a catchy media label for the U.S. bombing campaign in Iraq, its actual origins and a whole theory of warfare are found in a 1996 advisory report published by the National Defense University. Authored by Harlan Ullman of the National War College, it argues that the aim of modern warfare is not merely to achieve military victory, but also by means of sheer intimidation to inflict a deep psychological injury, to scare and terrorize potential rivals into submission. It is, in effect, the practical application of the Wolfowitz Doctrine of global domination through force. Describing shock and awe as, quote, massively destructive strikes directly at the public will, Ullman writes, quote, intimidation and compliance are the outputs we seek to obtain. The intent here is to impose a regime of shock and awe through delivery of instant, nearly incomprehensible levels of massive destruction directed at influencing society writ large. Through very selective, utterly brutal and ruthless, and rapid application of force to intimidate, Ullman continues, the aim is to affect the will, perception, and understanding of the adversary. Without senses, the adversary becomes impotent and entirely vulnerable. The reasons for the uh, extreme uh, hostility and fear that quickly uh, rose all over the world were not just the invasion of Iraq, but the fact that the invasion was understood to be uh, an action taken to demonstrate that this uh, 
program for global domination by force and crushing of any potential challenge uh, was meant extremely seriously.